I just need to ask some of my colleagues whether it's going live. some of my colleagues whether it's going live. But it's saying it's going now. So, so to those of you who are listening uh, live on YouTube, um, welcome. And the attendees that are now joining at a rapid pace, also welcome. Um, we've just started a few minutes early, uh, just so that those people that attend early can uh, obviously get a space in the uh, in the webinar room and those people that just a little bit tardy in joining will um, unfortunately have to go into the um, uh, they'll be redirected to, to YouTube live so we've uh, we've been discussing whether we're going to increase our webinar um, attendee numbers but um, it, it does cost quite a lot more to go over and above um, what we're uh, what we're currently uh, we're currently at uh, which is a hundred uh, uh, delegates uh, in the uh, in the room. So, um, <laughs> before I, you know, I'm not going to do any introductions until eight o'clock. But anyone who's listening, um, you know, we really appreciate you uh, you coming to uh, to these sessions. And please, the only way we get better is by your feedback. And and certainly every week we get lots of feedback, uh, both positive, uh, which is great. We like that, but we like even more is negative feedback because that's the only way we get better as, as clinicians and as, as people is listening to our, uh, our, our criticism. So uh, please do uh, email us my personal email, um, info at mikehayton.com or uh, at the Wrightington uh, Upper Limb Unit, I think has also got an email address, but that's not checked quite as much as uh, as, um, as my own personal email account. So we've now got uh, uh, 40 in the attendee room. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll just wait till eight o'clock and then uh, four more minutes. So Kat and George, so um, one of um, my ideas is to uh, potentially, and I'm not looking at you two in particular, although <laughs> if you feel like you could do, that'd be great, uh, is to be vibrant. <laughs> live on the, on YouTube by uh, a couple of uh, FRCS examiners. We would obviously want to choose somebody who's got the exam, um, who's thick skinned, and uh, we'll have the appropriate pre and post viva psychological testing, much in the way <laughs> they do on reality TV. Um, but do you think that's something that would go down well? You know, um, I think uh, it's, it's really interesting to see different examiners techniques. Uh, and it's also interesting to see you know, experienced candidates who've passed the exam, how they get themselves out of out of uh, awkward corners. Um, it's a bit tricky, really, because uh, obviously you don't want to be on live on YouTube. That'll be there forever, just making a complete <laughs> fool of yourself. But trust me, we've all got plenty of opportunity in the future to make fools of ourselves, and I do it on a regular basis, including not wearing sunscreen today, playing golf, because <laughs> it said it was going to rain, and clearly it didn't. But um, that's something that we might do, um, you know, when we get a bit more traction on this and, uh, and, and interest. So uh, we'll have to choose the examiners very carefully, and obviously the uh, the, uh, the candidate very carefully. But Kat, you're, you seem to be nodding quite a bit. Yeah, you're uh, I, you're uh, volunteering up first. I'm you? not volunteering today, oh, but right, I do okay. think it is a really good idea because I think as much as the knowledge is important, um, there's a lot about exam technique, and I think that's probably why quite a lot of people struggle with the exam um, and how to actually answer the questions. And that could be a really good way of, of demonstrating a good way of answering questions and maybe a not so good way. Um, in that maybe you have to pick that carefully, obviously, but having somebody that maybe has passed and has been yeah. through it to share their experiences as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, we always say that you kind of, well, when I teach on the FRCS course at Writington on the uh, on the hand section, you know, I try and get across to the to the delegates or people taking the exam. You you kind of walk into the FRCS off with a pass in your hand, and the examiner takes it off you if you fail. Whereas in all other exams I've ever taken before, you kind of walk in without a pass ticket in your hand. You've got to kind of earn that ticket. Whereas this is very much a professional exam at the end of your training. And the majority of the people that take the exam when I was an examiner for quite a while were great. And, and people kind of undo themselves, which, you know, is difficult because you're under extreme pressure. You know, and we as examiners 
totally know that. So get it in your mind when you're doing the exam that you're walking in with a pass ticket in your hand and nobody's going to take this off me. Now, you can make mistakes along the way. It's a bumpy road and, and hopefully there's more you know, peaks than troughs. Uh, but you know, even the best people, even the people who, who win the medal, um, uh, still have bumps in that in that few days. Apart from Lee, because obviously he was like gold medal uh, candidate. And, uh, Not at all. Did you get the medal, uh, Lee? No, no, thank you. Still waiting for it in the post, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, great. So we're uh, we're at eight o'clock now, and uh, it's almost uh, filled up now on the attendees. So uh, so that's that's great to see. So um, eight o'clock. It's uh, our usual uh, Sunday supper with Writington, and it's really great to see you all again. And thank you so much for all the, the positive feedback um, that we've been getting. We've really enjoyed this, me and my colleagues. We think it's a really important thing that we're offering for you at this terrible time. Um, you know, and Puneet Monga, my, uh, my colleague last week, it was just really nice when he said thank you to you all uh, for disrupting your training, doing things that you're not accustomed to, and, you know, and I reiterate his words, they're his words, you know, we are saying a big thank you. And that's why we're doing this. You know, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's a really important thing that inspires me is teaching, particularly to a receptive audience. And by the numbers we're getting every week, it certainly is receptive. So tonight, slightly different than our previous um, uh, uh, teaching sessions. Normally we have three short talks, but tonight it's such an important topic for the exam. We felt that we should do it justice by getting one keynote speaker to speak for about 40 minutes on the principles of tumour, MSK tumour. Um, it was just that, that awkward situation. None of your examiners will probably be tumour surgeons or will, will certainly not be examining you to become a tumour surgeon. The exam is about that day one consultant, keeping safe. So Lee is going to give you a talk today, what to do, what the red flag signs are, if you get a tumour, suspicious, uh, how you're going to handle that. How are you going to manage it and how are you going to refer it on? Um, as usual, you can ask Q&As throughout. Myself, Kat and George will be uh, looking at those questions. We'll be writing them down. So when Lee's given his talk, we'll then put those questions to him so he can keep focused on his talk in hand. Uh, if he feels the opportunity and he feels good enough that he can do two things at once, he might just suddenly see a question pop up and might just break his talk just to answer that one question. But I think generally speaking, he'll take those Q and A's at the end. We apologize if we miss any of them, by all means, email them to us. We'll send them on to, to leave for you. And then uh, at the end, he's got 10 MCQ questions that are really up, you know, up your street to, uh, to get you through to the exam, to reinforce hopefully what you've had from the learning experience of his talk. So it gives me great professional and personal pleasure to, uh, to invite Lee Jays, professor at, um, at uh, Birmingham Tumor Unit, uh, the Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Birmingham. I've known Lee since we were medical students, uh, which is a lifetime ago. <laughs> uh, we're both really old. I'm a bit older than him, uh, although, you know, uh, some might say, no, I'm joking. Uh, I've known him a long, long time. We've got lots of really great mutual friends. So it is incredible to see his career has just gone off the chart. So Lee, I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. Um, it's gonna be over to you. So hopefully, uh, we haven't actually practiced this screen share, but uh, you should have a screen share and I'm sure you're, uh, you've done lots of these sorts of things. So you should be able to- So uh, you've got to disable, you've got to disable it, Mike? I've got to what? Disable screen sharing. Who can share? All panelists. Who can, yeah, there you go. Has that come up now? Yeah. Right. Okay, guys, uh, well, thank you very much uh, for asking me to uh, come uh, or, or speak tonight. It's uh, Sunday uh, dinner, so we're having a little glass of wine while we do it. I'm going to talk about bone tumours, uh, predominantly bone tumours. It's very much on principles aimed for the exam. So for those who don't know me, I'm a tumour revision surgeon at the uh, R08 in Birmingham. We're actually one of the largest bone tumour units in the world. Uh, we do quite a lot of research. I've just stepped down from being chairman for the National Cancer Research Institute for Sarcomas, and we're pretty academic. So we publish about uh, 20 papers a year on average, uh, and we're doing a lot of trials. Sometimes I enjoy endurance events, and I like going out for a beer with Mike. Uh, uh, that is an endurance event. So for those of you who don't know much about the Orthopaedic Hospital, it's uh, very old, 1909. Originally started as the Birmingham Cripples uh, Hospital. You can't. Uh, say that anymore. 
It's uh, owned by the uh, Cadbury's factory and was originally a TB hospital, just like Wrightington. We've now got 12 theatres and we look after about 22 million people uh, for sarcomas and about 5 million people for uh, revisions. So we only look after England and Wales. Uh, we get about 4,000 suspected sarcoma referrals a year. So you should never have any concern about referring anything into us because we get a lot of referrals. And as you can see out of those 4,000 uh, cases in 2014, we died in those 600 bone tumors. So the vast majority of referrals are not primary bone tumors. About 190 primary bone tumors and some pelvic sarcomas and about 600 uh, soft tissue sarcomas. So it gets me to places that most orthopedic surgeons don't go and I tend to specialize uh, in the pelvis. Sometimes I get to go to some nice places to uh, talk about sarcoma. So what's the plan today then? So I'm going to give you a brief recap on tumor types and how we tell them apart. Uh, it's only a recap so you'll have to do a bit more reading but I'll tell you that salient points. Most important for the exam is a pass-fail question is how are you going to investigate a patient if you suspect they've got a bone tumor? And we'll briefly touch on some principles of surgery. So you sat there in the exam um, and the guys pulled up an x-ray for you and, or, or a lady has and said, what do you think this is? And you've got this unusual lesion, not what you're expecting. And I'm going to try and give you a way of answering for the exam because it's nervous. Huh? Everyone's really nervous when they get these. Um, and you set off and you're having fun, you think you're going well, and then at the end of it, it doesn't go quite as well as you thought it was going to go. So the whole idea about the exam is not to paint yourself into the corner. And the thing is with tumours is the vast majority of trainees never get to work in the tumour unit, so they don't get the exposure. It's just something you see and you send off, off to Birmingham or London or your local tumour unit. So don't forget our differential diagnosis. It may be normal or variant normal. It may be congenital, metabolic, inflammatory, infective, and never should the word tumour come out of your mouth in a viva without saying infection. And I'll show you why that is later. But there's a whole list of things it could be. And if we think it is a tumour, don't forget that it could be benign, it could be malignant, it could be a primary bone tumour, which is what we're going to talk about most, but it could be a secondary bone tumour as well. So it might be a metastatic disease. And never forget haematological malignancies. So myeloma is the commonest primary tumour that affects bone. Uh, and so it may be a myeloma or a plasmacytoma. And don't forget about lymphoma, which frequently uh, affects bone as well. So how am I going to help you? But it's actually the biggest secret going is there are four things that are going to help us. The age of the patient, the location of the tumour, whether that's where it is in the body, hip, knee, shoulder, spine, pelvis, and where it is within the bone. And then what does it look on, like on x-ray? And if we have those four things, I guarantee that you can be safe uh, to pass the exam because nobody is expecting you to have an in-detail knowledge of bone tumour. And of course, one of the other things that you might get asked is, are there any predisposing factors? Or you may be led into the question by, this child has had a tumour of their eye in the past, which is the question I was asked in my FRCS or. So what is a sarcoma? Sarcoma is a cancer that arises from cells of mesenchymal origin, okay? It's a very straightforward uh, thing. And anything, the basic building blocks of life, bone, cartilage, fat, nerve, muscles, blood vessels, or bone marrow are all mesenchymal in origin. And this is different from a carcinoma, which is where the cells come from epithelial cells. And sarcomas are very rare. They only uh, affect about 1% of all cancers. But importantly, they're about 15% of pediatric cancers. So there's a lot of focus on the pediatric side of things. And it comes from the Greek sarx, meaning flesh. So what are the common sarcomas we're going to talk about then? We'll talk about osteosarcoma, the most common primary bone tumour. 
chondrosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and I'll very briefly touch upon soft tissue sarcomas. You are very unlikely in the exam to get asked about soft tissue sarcomas. Now, because of the time today, I'm not going to have time to go into a lot about benign bone tumours or about metastatic disease. And if uh, it goes well today, I'm more than happy to come back and talk about those in the future. So how many do we have? We have about 150 osteosarcomas a year in the UK. Now, chondrosarcomas, we used to say there's about 100 chondrosarcomas a year in the UK, but that's changed recently. And actually, there's much more that we're seeing now, and we'll talk about why that is in, in a moment. Ewing sarcoma, very rare, 75 a year, but very important tumour. Um, uh, and then we've got uh, soft tissue sarcomas, uh, about 2,500 to about 3,000 a year. But this is all dwarfed by metastases, 60,000 uh, metastases of bone uh, a year. Okay, so osteosarcoma then. It's a bone forming tumor that normally uh, comes in the metaphysis. So we've already got a clue. It's in the metaphyseal area of the bone normally. As you know, for the exam, it has a bimodal age di uh, distribution. So more common in children, then it sort of goes away after 30 and come to 60. And we see it secondarily from radiation or Paget's disease. But the most common and the biggest spike is around 10 to 15 years old. And 60% of them are around the knee. So if the examiner gives you the lead in that this is a young boy of 10 to 15 years old with a tumor around the knee and you see new bone, then you should be thinking about osteosarcoma. They're sensitive to chemotherapy, so they're treated with chemotherapy first and then surgery and then chemotherapy afterwards. And for the prize, we're starting to get into more specialist stuff. There are four main types. The most common is starting in the center of the bone, conventional central osteosarcomas. And then we have two types on the surface of the bone, parosteal or perosteal. And then we have that lytic one, uh, the telangetic osteosarcoma, which is very rare. But the reason why it's important is sometimes it can be mistaken for benign tumor. And then we have the secondary tumours, as I said, arising either from radiotherapy or from Paget's disease. And so radiotherapy and Paget's disease are the two most common predisposing factors to a small percentage of osteosarcomas, but most of them come by themselves. There is a rare uh, uh, association with retinoblastoma, which is a tumour of the eye, and there's this multiple cancer gene, uh, Laufromani syndrome, uh, which has a P53 mutation, which is where most uh, osteosarcomas come from. If you know all of those things for the exam, you will pass with flying colors. So what does the examiner want? He wants to have buzzwords, because he's not a tumor surgeon, but he knows some things that sun ray speculation is often seen in osteosarcomas, and we'll talk about that. Codman's triangle is often seen, a periosteal reaction. They normally for, uh, form bone and their central or surface. Okay, what about chondrosarcoma? So this is a, uh, a cartilage forming tumor in the elderly, so more than uh, more common in the over 60s, and then more common around here. So if I say to you, I've got this 60 year old gentleman with uh, this tumor around his hip, you don't want to say osteosarcoma because we know the majority of those are going to be around the knee. It's not sensitive to chemotherapy or radiotherapy, and therefore the only treatment is surgery. The incidence is rising because the World Health Organization has changed the way it uh, classifies chondrosarcomas and uh, enchondromas greater than five centimeters in a uh, long bone and now classified as an atypical cartilage tumor or a grade one chondrosarcoma. And we see enchondromas in about 3% of all MRI scans of the shoulder or the knee. So actually the incidence is going up significantly. They're predisposed by osteochondromas. The rate of conversion to malignancy in osteochondroma is very controversial, but it's certainly less than one in a thousand. 
Enchondromas in the hand very rarely change, but can do. But if they're in long bone, they're more predisposed to becoming chondrosarcomas. And if we have lots of them and it's hereditary, like HME, hereditary multiple uh, exostosis, Olive's disease, multiple uh, enchondromas, or Mafuchi syndrome, multiple enchondromas with vascular abnormalities, the risk of conversion goes up much higher. So what does the exam want to hear? He wants to hear you describe it as a popcorn calcification. We'll see some pictures of that. It's in an older age. It's a cartilage lesion. It has a predisposition, and we're going to treat it with surgery. Okay, Ewing sarcoma is one that people are worried about. It, it tends to affect the diaphysis of a flat or long bone. So it can affect the ribs. Uh, it can affect uh, uh, the clavicle. Uh, sites that don't normally get uh, bone tumours, but it's virtually always in the diaphysis. And it starts off in the bone marrow and it's associated with large soft tissue mass. It's extremely rare over the age of 40. And in fact, it's pretty rare over the age of 20. So again, if I say I have a five-year-old uh, girl with a large soft tissue swelling in the middle of a tibia, as in this case, then you should be thinking of Ewing's rather than uh, osteosarcoma. It's possibly the only histology slide that you'll get in the exam, and they showed it to me, but this is really metal stuff, and it's small round blue cells. It's often confused with infection, why it's very important that, as I said, when you say tumour, you always say infection. And the cell of origin is a primitive neuroectodermal cell, again, if you want to. Uh, go for the prize, and it often has this translocation, the EWS fly gene between chromosome 11 and chromosome 22. Now, again, that's not particularly important, but it's nice if you know it, but that means that it doesn't have any predisposing factors because it's one cell that when it divided, part of the chromosomes crossed over. So that means that it shouldn't uh, have any predisposing factors. And it can be treated with both chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And typically the x-rays have these onion skinning. So uh, these layers of periosteum over the top of each other. It has a permittive pattern and it starts in the dermal. Soft tissue sarcomas are normally a painless deep lump in the thigh or in the arm. There are about 50 different subtypes and they're and named by the cell of their origin. So liposarcomas from fat, lyomyosarcomas from smooth muscle. And liposarcoma is the most common uh, tumor we see in the UK. It's generally a uh, uh, condition, again, of people over the 60s. And the way we should refer it, the nice referral criteria, are if the lump is more than four centimeters, if it's deep to fascia, if it's painful, which they often aren't, but if it is, that's worrying, or you've taken a lump out or somebody's taken a lump out and it's come back in that same size. If you have those criteria, that's when you should refer to a sarcoma unit. And they're normally treated with surgery with either radiotherapy up front or uh, at the end. Okay, so there's some important nomenclature that's very easy to get yourself tied up with. So what is the grade of the tumor? The grade of the tumor is how aggressive the cells are in that tumor. And so it's typically high grade or very aggressive or low grade and not very aggressive. The stage is where the tumor is in the body. And that can be local staging, where it is in that bone. Are there any skip metastases in that bone? Or it's systemic staging. Is it in other bones or is it in the chest, for example? The margin is did I, as a surgeon, get it all out? And how much of normal tissue did I get around it as a safety margin? So if somebody asks you the grade, what does the grade mean? It's how aggressive they are. If they ask you what the stage is, it means that it's uh, where is it in, in the body or the bone. And if I say, have I got a good margin or a wide margin, then that means, did I get it out properly? So where have we come from? Before the uh, 1980s, the amputation rate was 90% and the survival was very poor. And then there started to be uh, talks about limb salvage. Nowadays, for bone tumors, uh, Ewing's and osteo, we give chemotherapy before surgery, then we do surgery, and then we give more chemotherapy afterwards. 
The survival is about 60 to 70 percent for all comers, so it's much better now we have chemotherapy. We're able to avoid amputation in 95 percent of cases that are chemosensitive, and we're able to keep those limbs for about 20 years in 90 percent of patients. The quality of life scores are better than amputation, and about 40 percent of implants will last 20 years. So the reason we tend to do more limb salvage now is because it's possible because of the chemotherapy. In Birmingham, we tend to use three quarters of the cases of endoprosthesis, about 10% biological re re reconstructions, about 3% uh, excisions, and we still have an amputation rate of about 15% because chondrosarcomas often can be cured by an amputation. So this is a kid that we'll come back to at the end. Ryan, he was two years old, he had a total femoral Ewing's uh, replacement at the age of two. Okay, so how do I tell them apart? How do I spot a tumour? So I take a history, an exam, always your first answer. And we've already talked about the age of the patient, where it is, is it painful? And is that pain mechanical only on weight bearing or more importantly, non-mechanical? So does it hurt at night when he's not, or he or she is not uh, walking on? They often present with a limp, and they often, if they present with a pathological fracture, have symptoms before they fracture it. And you've got to ask yourself, was there really enough force to break that bone simply from standing, from a, uh, falling from a standing height? For metastatic disease, it's important we ask about smoking, but it's often a relatively painless lump on the leg. So the X-ray really is the key to our answer. And we should be looking for bone destruction or new bone formation. Those two things are bad signs. What it's doing to the periosteum. Is there any soft tissue swelling? Is there any missing bits from a fracture? And we'll talk about this zone of transition. Can I draw around the edge of the tumour with a, a, a line? And if I can, it's very well demarcated, then it's most likely to be benign. A narrow zone of transition means that it's more likely to be a benign tumour. If I can't really tell the area between the normal bone and the abnormal bone, then that's a wide zone of transition, and that's very worrying. And osteosarcomas come in all shapes and sort of sizes, just like chameleons. They're all osteosarcoma, and these are all chameleons, but they look very different. So how are we going to help? So we've talked about the age. Um, some things come in specific ages. So simple bone cysts, uh, Ewing sarcoma, osteochondromas tend to come before the age of 20, um, uh, osteosarcomas. But again, as I said, if you look at chondrosarcomas, myelomas, um, they tend to come in uh, at an older age group. So if we sat with a, a sub 30 year old, then that automatically changes our differential diagnosis. On the left, you have a condition that looks very similar to the one on the right, but it's a child with epiphysis still open. So that makes it um, uh, Langham cell histiocytosis, where on the right, uh, because of the age, that makes it myeloma. We've talked about the site in the bone. Which part of the bone is it in? Is it in the epiphysis? Is it next to the joint? Is it in the metaphysis or the diaphysis? And there's a, a very famous uh, picture that you should uh, look at before the uh, exam, and I'll send, and send you a copy uh, to Mike to distribute. Um, but if it tells us whereabouts, it generally tends to be in that chondroblastoma. Osteosarcomas, again, are more common in the uh, metaphysis. So we can see here on the left, we've got a uh, a tumour inside the epiphysis, and so that's going to be a chondroblastoma. And on the right, if that was a 20-year-old, we would say that that is a giant cell tumour because it's eccentric uh, up against the uh, joint surface. If it's bone forming in the metaphysis, we're going to say osteosarcoma. If we say that there isn't a lot of new bone formation, but it's in the diaphysis, we're more likely to say Ewing's. And then where is it inside the bone? On the left, we can see a narrow zone of transition. So we're thinking it's a benign tumor. And you can see that it's a cystic lesion. So 
that's a simple bone cyst. Um, as you can see, uh, again, a uh, uh, expanded lesion looks a little bit more uh, worrying, uh, but actually it's an aneurysmal bone cyst. Is it on the cortex of the bone? So typically on the lateral cortex of the distal tibia, that's a non-ossifying fibroma. And so is it on the surface of the bone? So these are periosteal tumors. So on the left, again, we've got a relatively uh, well demarcated lesion, whereas on the right, we've got a very diffuse lesion. So the one on the left is benign, it's a chondroma. The one on the right is a, a periosteal osteosarcoma. And parosteal osteosarcomas are virtually always on the posterior aspect of the distal femur. So we can see an irregular tumor, a wide zone transition at the back of the distal femur. And that's a typical site for a parosteal. But don't forget that different conditions from different origins can cause. So TB can look very much like a, a tumor. Uh, infection uh, can very much look like a tumor, and osteomyelitis or um, sickle cell disease can look very much like a tumor. So the last thing is the radiological appearance, and this is probably the most important thing. What's happening at the margin of the tumor? What's the cortex doing in response to that tumor? And uh, is there a soft tissue mass? And is there a periosteal reaction? So these cases have a narrow zone of transition. So you can see all the way around the edge of the tumor and you can see what's normal bone and what's abnormal bone. So that will make those benign conditions. In these ones, it's less easy to see where the normal bone and the tumor is and it has a moth-eaten appearance. And if we look very carefully at the x-ray, we can see this periosteal uh, reaction uh, and Is a at the one at the end is a sarcoma. And then does it have a permeative growth, growth pattern? Does it look like it's eating away at the bone uh, in the diaphysis? And if we look at it in close, you can see that the cortex has got lots of little pits in it. Whereas on these ones, you can see that the GEN tumor is relatively well demarcated, it's expanded, but that means it's growing slowly because the bone has had chance to keep its cortex and respond to the tumor. If it's eating away at the inside of the bone, that still means that it's slow growing because the cortex has been maintained around the edge of the tumor. If the bone has been destroyed, that in indicates very rapid growth, then we have this wide zone of transition. So if the cortex is intact, that's a good sign, but if the cortex is being damaged, that's a bad sign. You can see very rapid growth um, and you can see on this one that the x-ray looks relatively normal but the MRI shows us the, uh, um, the rapid growth. So osteosarcomas sometimes don't always show up but you can see a large soft tissue swelling on this x-ray which shows you where the tumor is. If we get sorcerization or eating away at the cortex again that is a sign of rapid growth. And if we obviously have a large soft tissue mass, then again, we're thinking of a, a malignant tumor. Now the examiner isn't expecting you to say the one on the left is an osteosarcoma. They want you to recognize that this is a bad thing and that it needs investigating further. And then we talked about the mineralization. Is it producing bone or is the bone being eaten away? And cartilage tumors have this typical, what's known as uh, popcorn, like uh, the uh, bone has been eaten away in little chunks. If we have a ground glass appearance, then that tends to tell us that it's fibrous tissue. And in these cases, it's uh, fibrous dysplasia. And if we have a perosteal reaction with layers and layers of new bone over it or onion skinning, then we're thinking of a Ewing's sarcoma. But it's not necessarily only Ewing's that have it. But if you said, I think that's a Ewing's to me, I would say, I can see why you say that. There's absolutely no problem. Chondrosarcomas often have this spiculated or sun ray appearance, and this is calcification in the periosteal um, 
uh, uh, capillary vessels and the tumor is growing so fast it's putting tumor down in the uh, capillaries and that's why we have this sun ray speculation. Middle and that's where the tumor has lifted up the periosteum and it's most commonly seen in osteosarcoma where the periosteum has been lifted up and actually if you look at that area it doesn't tend to have tumor in it. The reason why I say that when we're in the exam we always mention tumor we always mention infection is because one of these is a Ewing's and one of these is osteomyelitis and I can't tell you by looking at it which one it is and therefore you always have to make sure that you say both because not everything that's gold glitters. So not everything is a tumor. So that's the most difficult bit. Those are the x-rays. You've seen lots of x-rays. They're not supposed to be that you uh, can say that's that, but hopefully now you have an idea of looking at the x-rays to help you decide what kind of tumor it is. So the examiner said to you now, that it might be a bit, <coughs> sir or madam, <coughs> what am I going to do? You're going to take a history and examination. You're going to give them your differential diagnosis. And then you're going to do some tests. You're going to do some general tests and some specific tests. I'm going to take a bit more history about family history, past medical history and symptoms. I'm going to look for uh, congenital lesions like neurofibrosis, nodes, check the neurovascular status. You always say that I'm going to examine the breast and do a PR because it could be a metastasis from breast tumor or prostate. And if it's a pathological fracture, as we said, you need to think about the amount of force because about 10% of osteosarcomas will present with a pathological fracture. This is an unfortunate case of a fracture which was uh, treated with Nancy nails. And then it was only when the bone uh, started to be dis uh, destroyed but as you can see that there's a permeative pattern around there and there's missing bit. And lines up with a total femoral replacement rather than total femoral replacement. So if it's not quite right, and the examiner says, so you're not sure, what are you gonna do? Well, I could take an X-ray on the other side and think about what it could be, but there's no uh, problem because that's what you would do in real life is that I would go to my musculoskeletal radiologist and I'd ask their opinion. That's a perfectly safe and valid response. But tests that I'm going to do in the emergency department, full plug out ESR and CRP to rule out infection, uh, electrolytes because hypercalcemia is a life-threatening condition and can be uh, caused in metastatic disease. I'm going to do a myeloma screen and tumor markers, and I'm going to do a chest X-ray as an initial screening test for uh, uh, chest metastases. And then I'm going to do staging studies. And that's a really good phrase to use. I'm going to stage the patient locally to find out how big it is. And systemically to find out if there's disease elsewhere. So the local staging is an MRI scan. It's no radiation, it's very sensitive, and it shows us much more. You can see some periosteal reaction here, a little pathological fracture and a large soft tissue mass, but the MRI scan shows us that that mass is much bigger, but because it's multiplanar, I can look in different uh, directions and see that it's in the joint. CT scan of the chest is uh, very accurate. If I'm thinking about metastatic disease, I want a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis. Um, somewhere on here is a chest metastasis from an osteosarcoma, and you can see that they're very small calcified peripheral lesions. Uh, we tend to do uh, bone scans and we find skip metastases in about 5 to 10 percent of uh, patients. And so a bone scan is very useful uh, to see the bones. So full stage or scans of the whole uh, limb uh, or whole bone affected is important. As you can see here, the uh, skip metastasis and the hip joint uh, as well. If you can't find uh, the primary tumor, you've looked in a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis, then it could be a primary bone tumor. So if you can't find another lesion, then you need to call uh, the primary bone tumor unit. And be kept beware of the pressures to uh, operate on the patient straight away. 
because it actually makes a huge team is needed to try and sort these out. We have radiologists, we have orthopedic surgeons, oncologists, rehab and palliative care people in our NDT. So when should you biopsy? When all the other tests are normal, if the diagnosis is in downs, definitely before you doing something you regret, because you'll never be blamed by asking whether to do a biopsy in the tumor unit. Some lesions are very recognizable. Uh, these are clearly benign lesions which will, you'll come across very frequently, so they don't need a biopsy. And if the patient has multiple metastatic disease or is very unwell, then again, you probably don't need to discuss it with a primary bone tumor. But if you don't know what it is, if you think that it could be a malignant or aggressive tumor, and certainly if it's solitary and you can't find anything on your staging studies, you need to discuss it with a bone tumor. Who should do the biopsy? It should be a surgeon with experience, a surgeon with a pathologist, and the surgeon who will carry out the definitive uh, surgery. So it should definitely be referred to a tumor unit. We should use image guidance, all of our cases are biopsy now, because 30% of biopsies in DGH is We do all needle biopsies nowadays. We do the incision, uh, the biopsy in line with the incision that we're going to use so we can excise the biopsy tract. We try to go through as few compartments as uh, uh, possible. We make sure we hit the tumor and we always send some for microbiology. And in Ewing's cases, we often send them for cytogenetics and bone marrow as well. But for the exam, this is a pass fail question. Okay, because you say, I'll, I'll refer it to the, to the tumor unit, and then I'll say, well, how would you do a biopsy? I'm going to do it with a needle. I'm going to do it in line with a definitive incision. I'm not going to contaminate as much tissue as needed, and I'm going to send it for some cultures and histology. Chemotherapy uh, for uh, osteo and Ewing's is very complicated. You don't need to know much about it, apart from the fact that they're having it. The aim from is to reconstruct the tumor uh, and excise the tumor with the minimal morbidity, with the maximum restoration of function, with the lowest complications in a way that's acceptable to the patient and the family. So what operation could we do for this bone forming tumor around the knee in a young person, and therefore an osteosarcoma? Well, we could do an amputation. We could do a prosthesis, endoprosthesis. We could do an allograft. We could do an autograph, so the patient's own bone. We could do bone distraction. We could do an arthrodesis. And we could do this funny operation called a rotation pasture. But the most important thing is that we're trying to get the tumor out with clear margins. So they may ask you, what is the Enikin sta uh, staging system for an osteosarcoma? But it's quite simple, it's divided So 1A is a low-grade tumour, 1B is a low-grade tumour, and the A means that it's in, in the same bone, and the B means it's broken out of the bone. 2A means that it's high-grade and it's in the bone, and 2B means that it's high-grade and out of the bone, and grade 3 means that it's disseminated to other parts of the body or has metastasis. So 1 means low-grade, 2 means high-grade, Three means metastasis, A inside the bone, and B outside the bone. And that's the Enneken system. We've actually come up with a, a, a classification for determining outcome. If we wanted to quote it in the exam, it's, a, a, it's a, about to become the new way of doing it. But what about the margin? So the classification of margins is typically intralesional, inside the tumor, marginal, outside the tumor, but very close to it, and wide away from it. And that's where the Berman classification helps because it says that you need to be two, more than two millimeters away from the tumor. So how are we gonna reconstruct it? Majority of patients will have a, uh, an endoprosthesis because they're readily available. They can be custom or modular. They allow the patient to get up and weight bear on them straight away, and they allow a rapid return to function. 
And that function is normally about 80% of normal. They have a relatively low early complication rate, but the disadvantages of tumor prosthesis is that they're expensive, so they can't be used in some parts of the world. And of course, the risk of them failing goes up in time. Fractures of the bone, periprosthetic fractures or fractures of the implant are fortunately relatively uncommon, but the infection rate is very uh, high compared to hip replacement surgery because the patients are going back on their chemotherapy straight after surgery. So the infection rate is around about 10%, and of course they're going to come loose in time. There's about a 10% risk of a lifelong amputation, either for infection or local occurrence. And of course it means a break in their chemotherapy. And we know that it's the chemotherapy which is going to cure the patient. What bones can we replace? We can replace pretty much any bone. So a total humerus, distal radius, a hemipelvic replacement, a total femur, a proximal tibia, a diaphysis of the bone. So this is the most common uh, 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 type of tumor. It's an osteosarcoma because it's in a young child that's growing around the knee. You can see that once we removed it, we've left the biopsy tract on it, which is at the top of the picture. We've uh, removed the tumor with a layer of normal tissue around it. And then we've used a custom made growing implant uh, to replace it. The survival of the implants are relatively good in the humus and proximal femur, about 85% survived at uh, 20 years in the proximal femur, uh, less so around the knee. This is a lady that's had a distal femoral replacement 30 years ago, and you can see her walking without much of a limb. Proximal femoral replacements often lose the abductors, so they often have a little bit of a limp, but that's been in again for 20 years. And proximal humeruses have poor function because they've lost their rotator cuff, but actually because they have a good function of their elbow and their hand, patients actually rate them quite well. What about children? Well, we have growing prosthesis in children that can be expanded. These are the old type, which had a little cog mechanism in them. And then we have a sliding uh, a component um, uh, afterwards. And on, on the other side, it was not uh, used. This is the old jack mechanism. This is a lady that had one uh, for 30 years. She had the first extended implant in Birmingham. Uh, she had it in 1981. She had four lengthenings, two revisions. She broke a patella. Then we took a patella out. Then we put a new patella back in. She broke a tibia. She's worn out two husbands, she's had three children, and she drives a lorry, uh, and now she's a grandmother. Now we have non-invasive prosthesis. So these have little magnets in the bottom of the prosthesis, uh, which motors which get turned off. And with the advances in engineering, we can now uh, save uh, the joint, uh, providing we're away from the uh, tumor. And you can see here, it's a case I was helping out in Hong Kong because we've kept the ligaments and just replaced the bone, you can see that they have a very good function. Proximal humeruses, we're starting to use more and more um, uh, uh, reverse shoulders, so the similar reconstruction uh, resection, but the girl on the right has had a reverse shoulder with a, a better than average result, it has to be said. Biological options are good for good prognosis tumors, we have to wait longer for them to work, so we don't want to use them in the worst cases, but they're good in areas that are difficult to reconstruct, like the distal radius, the mid shaft of the tibia or the whole uh, pelvis. We can take the tumor out and irradiate it and put it back in again, and children are amazing, so you can see that the fibula's regrown uh, in this case, and again, uh, with good function. So that's an, uh, uh, radiation and reimplantation again with a, a whole um, distal uh, humerus. We can get growing um, um, blood uh, uh, supplies. So if we take a fibula with a, uh, a blood supply, uh, we can put it back in and the fibula will continue to grow. And it's particularly good in the humerus and uh, in the distal radius. Salvage procedures are one of the most uh, disappointing um, um, are uh, consented for, um, uh, sorry, all, all the uh, patients uh, don't necessarily are able to have 
uh, limb salvage. Um, unfortunately, this patient uh, has uh, had a pathological fracture and uh, was uh, nailed, and therefore the only option was either a rotation plasty or a hip disarticulation. Um, you can see, unfortunately, the whole of the anterior compartment is uh, uh, affected. Um, hip uh, disarticulations or hind cord transplantations are uh, an unpleasant operation, but this is Jamie, one of my patients, um, and he's had uh, plays uh, football for uh, Manchester City. Um, and you can see that he has an amazing uh, level of function um, to be done. But sometimes we do an unusual operation called a rotation plastic. This is where we convert the, L, the um, foot into an, uh, a new knee, knee joint by putting it on backwards. Uh, this is Amelia, uh, one of our patients who's recently been uh, in the news quite a lot, learning how to get the proprioception back. And the reason why we do it is because they can convert this into a, uh, a below knee amputation rather than an above knee amputation, uh, giving good function. So this is Ryan, and I started off with his uh, 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 total femoral replacement at the age of two. He's now 30, he's had 30 operations, two length, uh, uh, 25 lengthenings, two revisions, one infected prosthesis, and a two-stage revision. And you can see that um, he's uh, grown to a, a, a strapping uh, young man. So tumors are, are complicated, um, they're unusual, but it's important that you don't get caught out by them. And hopefully if we stick to the principles of the first stage of the talk, then you'll have a, a good way to answer any questions about them. Thank you very much. So, um, Lee, if you could uh, just close your screen down, I guess. Um, you know, that was just absolutely incredible. I am blown away. I've had so many messages sent through to me during that talk about just how good it was. You know, I wish that that talk was given to me just before I went into the exam. I mean, it was just incredible. And it's things like that that make me realise this is why we do it. This is why we do these educational things. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in shock about how good that was. It was perfectly pitched for the exam. And it's just incredible to see what amazing work that you do. And, you know, these patients are uh, forever grateful because, you, you know, you, you save their lives. Not only that, you know, hopefully you're saving a lot of candidates' lives in the exam. So it was incredible. I mean, really amazing. So, Kat, George, do you, um, you want to... There was a few questions come through. I've got a few questions as well. Um, I'll, I'll just kick it off while... Um, so you, you mentioned about the NICE guidelines um, uh, being the four centimetres. Is that four centimetres on clinical exam or is that four centimetres on imaging, ultrasound or MRI? So it's based, it's based for GPs, so it's just a clinical exam. It used to be five centimetres and then we found yeah. that it was, um, it was about uh, more accurate with four centimetres. The, the simple rule of thumb is if it's bigger than a golf ball and it's got fascia over it, then it needs to be referred. That was great. And then I'm sorry to hog this because I'm I've just got them written down. Uh, on your slide 68, you said, and, and your wife I just dropped out, you said cartilage tumors have the typical, and there was some appearance. Can you just uh, go over that? Can oh, you remember that? Popcorn. Popcorn. popcorn oh, that's great. Yeah. All right, great. So they, they look they look like they've eaten the bone away in little little scallops around it. I don't think it looks like any popcorn I've ever eaten, but that's the buzzword that the examiners are looking for. Right. Kat, George, do uh, any of you two want to pick up a question or, or Lee, do you want to just read them yourself? I mean, you know, hopefully Kat and George have picked up some salient ones that are relevant for the exams. Say so it's Lee, I'm to read every question. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, the first one I've got here. So someone's asked how much bone destruction we'd see before uh, plain x-ray changes. So I guess a, a quantity. Uh, that's actually an excellent question because actually you need about 50% of the bone to be destroyed before it shows up on plain x-ray. So um, by the time the bone being eaten away, then actually you've, you've, already, you've already got at least 50% of the bone have been destroyed. 
Great, thank you. Um, there was another question uh, asking about how to differentiate um, a uh, enchondroma from a low <coughs> chondrosarcoma in the hand. Okay. Well, if, if I could tell you how to differentiate a low-grade chondrosarcoma and an enchondroma, I would be sat in the Caribbean currently with a very large gin and tonic. It's possibly the most uh, difficult question. The pathologist can't tell the difference between a low-grade enchondroma, sorry, a low-grade chondrosarcoma and enchondroma. What are we looking for? We're looking for a tumour that is eating away at the cortex of the bone. So generally in the hand, enchondromas will fracture and then they'll heal and the pain will go away. If they stay painful and they've broken out of the cortex, then it's more likely to be chondrosarcoma. However, chondrosarcomas at the hand are incredibly rare. Um, but if you apply that principle to long bones, so I've got a, I've had an MRI of a shoulder from a rotator cuff problem, and the MRI has shown a five centimetre cartilage tumour. Is it an enchondroma or a low-grade chondrosarcoma? Then the World Health Organization say if it is greater than five centimetres, it should be treated as a chondrosarcoma. And the reason why that's important is because 99% of people will survive if it's a grade one chondrosarcoma, and only 45% of people will survive if it's a grade three chondrosarcoma. So we really wanna pick up those ones very early. So it might seem over treatment, but actually we know that they go from grade one to grade two to grade three to eventually the differentiation, which is universally fatal. So Lee, I, um, you know, I, in, in sort of 20 odd years of hand surgery, I've only seen a, a few tumours, thankfully. Um, but mm. I do remember one that sticks out a long time ago. It was um, referred to me as a seed ganglion, you know, at the base of the A1 yeah. pulley. It was in a, a youngish guy, sort of uh, in his 30s, I guess. Mm. Um, it was growing, uh, but sometimes these can be a little bit, you know, uh, a few millimetres and you're palpable. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the ultrasound scan that had been done at the referring hospital said it was a cyst. Uh, so I thought it was going to be a C. I excised it. It didn't look quite right. But what was really mm -hmm. interesting for him was preoperatively he had pins and needles along one of the um, yeah. one of the digital nerves. And and for me it was you know I'll just I'll, and I wrote in my clinic letter you know unusually he has pins and needles along the finger. And um, we took it out and he came back as a high grade whatever. And um, mm -hmm. and I referred him on to you know to a, a tumor specialist. But you know can you just is that the tumour throwing out chemicals, uh, irritating the nerve? How? Because yeah. it's not a pressure effect, because we see it's it all the time. It's not a pressure effect at all, no. It's, a, it's an inflammatory reaction around it. And when you see that on the MRI scan, if you get an MRI scan, which you may or may not do nowadays, then you see a lot of edema around it. In the hand, it's pretty unusual, but particularly in places. And one thing that is very common in hand surgery, particularly, is a BPOPs, bizarre parosteal osteochondromatous lesions. And we get those sent in all the time. What do you think about that? We have a daily MDT, a little bit like you guys have a daily trauma ward round. We look at it with the, with the radiologist and you'll say, oh no, that's just a BPOP, don't worry about it. And we'll get the answer back the same day. So why, why have the worry yourself? And certainly for the trainees, certainly for the trainees in the exam, Somebody puts something up, you don't, don't know what it is. It's an ABC, you're very happy it's an ABC. Okay, fine. But the safe answer is to say, I'll discuss it with the tune unit. And if the guy scoffs at you and say, well, it's clearly a whatever, you can't be failed because that's a safe thing to do. There's a couple of questions asking about whether in the exam we need to be able to identify um, tumours from the histology. No. The only, the only one that you would ever get, and if you did, as Mike will tell you from being an examiner, if someone's shown you histology sides, then you're, you're, you're going for the eights rather than the fours. No one's going to give you a histology slide. The only histology slide you might get is a Ewing sarcoma, and there's lots of little blue cells on there. But if you've asked that, you've passed a long, long time ago. 
So Lee, just um, you know, years ago, I remember um, listening to a sort of a tumor principles talk, and um, it was a, a discussion of you know if you see something suspicious. And I remember doing this case, and you know, and I was suspicious when I saw it, and the preoperative pins and needles. Having been told it was an ultrasound, I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. I um, I used separate instruments to close, mm -hmm. and I and I washed the uh, or soaked the wound with normal water. Mm -hmm. for five, 10 minutes. You know, what are your thoughts about that for the candidates and the exams? You know, you come across this unexpected lump, doesn't look great. Is that a good thing to do or is that old hat? No, so it's all bad. So if you, um, if you come across a lump in the operation you were unexpecting, the simplest thing to do is take a small sample of it, close up and send it to the histology and then refer it on. Because we can get out of that but if you've scraped it all around or you've tried to take it out and you let try taking out a lump where you don't know where it is anymore. You end up doing amputations or you end up doing very wide resections. So if you're in the exam and the examiner says, you're doing a DHS, you assume it was for a simple fracture neck of femur, you get in and lots of cartilage starts coming out. What do you do? Simple answer is, I would take some samples, uh, I would uh, uh, close and put the patient on traction and discuss it with the tumor nurse. So that whole, uh, you know, soaking it with water, because in the hand, obviously, things are a lot smaller. Yeah, you, very different. You, and would you advocate using separate instruments or not? Uh, well, I mean, you're effectively doing an open biopsy at that stage, haven't you? So yeah. I think what you're doing is, is that's all going to be excised if it does turn out to be a cyanobial sarcoma or whatever it turns out to be. Yeah. I don't think there's much evidence for, for say, line or for simple water. There's no evidence? No, I think so. All right, that's great. Well, well that's uh, good. Me. Yes. All right. So, George, Cap? Got a, another question sort of on the same lines, asking what the role of incisional biopsy is um, and whether it should only be used if needle biopsy is inconclusive. Uh, yeah, so the only reason that we will do a needle biopsy is if, uh, sorry, an open biopsy is if uh, one or two uh, needle biopsies have been inconclusive. So uh, it's been found that you can get a diagnosis from 99% of uh, needle biopsies and uh, uh, our miss rate uh, in terms of not getting it on two biopsies, uh, as I said, is, is less than 1%. Um, occasionally we do because the pathologists will occasionally say, this is a really, really unusual tumor. I don't, I don't know what it is from the few cells that you've given me. In which case, they'll often ask us to go back and do an open biopsy. But that will happen once every two months, um, probably in our unit. Great, thank you. And, and how do you mark your incision? You know, you, you, you said you do your um, incision biopsy and then you mark it. So we tend to do a uh, tattooing of the, of the skin. So we put a, uh, a tattoo on the area where the biopsy is being very much like they do for radiotherapy. You might have seen patients who have radiotherapy have little tattoo, little uh, ink dots around where it is. Great, and I've just so your um, ten percent infection rate for endoprostheses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you give prolonged antibiotics, uh, or would you still just give you a single shot? Pre no, so I tend to give prolonged antibiotics. There's just been a big world trial on, on the length of antibiotics, which we haven't got the results for. But what we are using more and more is silver coated prosthesis. So we use uh, tumor prosthesis, which are covered in silver, and they halve our infection rate. So they bring it down to about 5%, but they don't get. Right. So, Kat and George, if you just take one more question each um, and then. Um... We'll go to the to the questions, um, the MCQs, which you know is always always popular. We always try and wrap these up at about nine fifteen or something like that. So, uh, um, Kat, George, one question each, and then we'll go to the uh, the MCQs, and Lee will talk you through them. So, Mohammed Hassan is asking, how do you differentiate between an ABC and a telangiectasic osteosarcoma? Okay. So that's one of the reasons why we do uh, biopsies, because actually it's very hard to tell. If you have uh, a subarticular lesion uh, in, a, in a child, 
it is more likely to be an ABC, but we biopsy all ABCs. So simple bone cysts, if they have that fallen leaf sign um, presented with a pathological fracture, 80% are in proximal humerus. We all see those in clinic. It's fine to watch and wait. But if you've got an expanded cortex and a lytic lesion, even though you're pretty sure it's an ABC, refer it on and then it'll normally get a biopsy. I think that right. happily answers Mr. Ahmed's question about um, the criteria for referral in that you're happy to receive referrals. Um, Anything. But the, the, it's a bit like, um, there's no stupid questions. There's nev never a case where we look at it and everyone's laughing behind your back because it just doesn't happen. Right. One, one last from you, George. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there are two questions, but I'll ask them as one. So, someone's uh, back to biopsy asking what site of the tumor you try and biopsy and what needle you would usually use a true cut or just a simple needle? Okay. Yeah. So, we use um, true cuts for soft tissue lesions and a jam sheedy needle biopsy, which is very similar to a hollow needle for bone tumors. And the pathology. is ticketed in the junction between the normal bone and the abnormal bone. So one of the mistakes people do when they do a biopsy is they get right into the center of the tumor, then they take the thing out and scrape it around a bit, but that often is very necrotic. What the pathologist wants to see is they want to see the junction between the normal bone and the abnormal bone so they can see if it's infiltrating into the normal bone. Um, so always take your needle out as you go through the normal bone into the tumor, put a 20 mil syringe on, apply some suction to keep that core in and then pull it out. You can take multiple biopsies, but always through the same incision. So you can go through lots of different planes, but always through the same incision. Great, thank you. That's great, uh, Lee. So um, you could just have a little rest for, for a minute or two, Lee, just while um, I'm gonna run the first poll now, uh, yeah. which is just a, a simple demographics. Uh, I should have done this at the beginning, but you know, we're learning all the time. So what Lee's going to do is on, on the next poll, when I launch it, there'll be all 10 questions will go up. And of course, if you're a superstar and you, you know everything, you can just whiz through all 10. But what I suggest is perhaps Lee will just read out the question, question one. He won't read out the individual A, B, C, D. Let you do that. We'll wait sort of 10 to 20 seconds. After 10 to 20 seconds, he'll say, you know, five more seconds you know, let's move on to the second question. He'll then read the second question. We'll go through all 10 questions. We'll then end the poll. We'll share the results like we've just shared here. And then he'll then tell you why such an answer is the right answer and why some of them aren't the real answer. Is that okay? So look, that's been pretty consistent that we have um, is that the vast majority of these are people are pre-exam and that's exactly who we were uh, aiming um, uh, this uh, this result for can you you probably all can all see that so uh, eighty nine percent are all pre exam so that's uh, that's great so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, do uh, poll number two so um, Lee can I um, can I hand that over to you now yeah so have you put the questions up or oh, do you want me uh, to share my right, screen right. very good no that's good <laughs> I'm not allowing the panelists to vote because you'd see how rubbish I am all right. So we talked about it right at the beginning of the talk, which is the most common primary bone tumor in the under 16 or the children's? Conosarcoma, Ewing's, osteo, chordoma, or giant cell tumor? Primary bone tumor in children, okay? All right, we'll move on to the second question then. Uh, which primary bone tumour does not have an association with a pre-existing condition? So we talked about conditions that are to choose. Was it chondrosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, chordoma? One we didn't talk about was soft tissue tumour called a fibrosarcoma, the or bone tumour called a fibrosarcoma. So we talked about... Guys, if you can answer them as you go along. Are you able yeah. to do that? Yeah, if you want. Nobody's uh, answered question one yet. I don't know whether... Uh, say no. No, nobody's voted yet, but... Uh, Nobody wants to show... Uh, it's, all, it's all in uh, anonymous, isn't it, presumably? 
Oh, hold on. Someone's uh, uh, said it looks like we need to answer all of them before we can submit. Okay, so that's fine. All right. Okay. All right. We're going as uh, we go in. So we, we talked about which ones are preconditioned positions. Uh, number three, where is the commonest site of presentation? So we talked about where tumors are in bone. Is it in the middle of the femur? Is it in the pelvis? Is it in the distal tibia or the distal femur? So where's the most common site of presentation for osteosarcoma? Okay, are we happy? Do you want me to move on? Okay. Question four then, which tumor does not metastasize to lungs? Now this is a little bit of a tricky question. Chordoma, osteosarcoma, chondroblastoma, giant cell tumor, or eosinophilic granuloma. Now this is, this is a bit of a prize. This is one of the MCQs that, that if you get it, you know, you've done really well. So which one does not metastasize? So we're looking for a benign tumor to start off with. And then you'll show some extra knowledge if you know that they can metastasize. So we talked about Enneken's classification and malignant bone tumors. And we talked about the uh, classification was a low grade inside the bone or outside the bone. Is it a high grade inside or outside the bone or is it metastatic at presentation? Uh, which one do you think is the most common presentation of osteosarcoma? High grade or low grade, inside or outside the bone, or metastatic? Okay, question six. We talked about the treatment of different tumors. So which ones are typically treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Chondrosarcoma. Ewing's, osteosarcoma, chordoma, or soft tissue sarcoma. So which one of those, anything can be treated by anything, but typically which ones are treated by both chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Okay, so which of these tumors causes destruction of the bone and is found around the cortex juxtacortically, normally eccentric in patients between the age of 20 and 40. Is it a chordoma, an osteosarcoma, aneurysmal bone cyst, giant cell tumor, or eosinophilic granuloma? Okay, number eight, which is the most common soft tissue sarcoma in the UK. Synovial sarcoma, liposarcoma, liomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, or fibrosarcoma. I did say that in my talk. Question nine, which is not an appropriate investigation bone sarcoma center without discussing it with a tumor? Which it one is like the... listened to me. Huh? It's like they've listened to you. <laughs> Which one's not an appropriate investigation? And the final bone uh, question, sorry. Which tumor is typically found in the epiphysis of the long bones? So it's in the epiphysis. And we, show, we showed some pictures at the beginning. Uh, a Ewing sarcoma, an osteosarcoma, a chondroblastoma, a chondrosarcoma or an eosinophilic granuloma. So some of those questions are quite hard. They're typical sort of MCQs. Some are straightforward, some are more difficult. They've done well if you've got uh, more than seven out of 10. So we'll just have a little chat so people can just flick up and down once because it says they can only answer all 10 at once. So I did, I did it cold, you know, when you sent it to me and uh, I have to say I wasn't greatly and I'm certainly not going to share it with anyone what my, uh, what my score <laughs> was. But I think I've done a lot better after your talk. I'm not saying I've got 100%, but I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm in much better shape um, than I was uh, uh, an hour and 10 minutes ago. You know, and again, Lee, um, just while people are going through that, I can still see people are still answering. You know, what a fantastic talk, mate. I mean, you know, it was amazing. Um, 
I think you've just helped so many people getting through the exam, which is what we want to do. But I genuinely think you've you've changed people's practices. I think people will now not take on that open biopsy um, and send it to, to someone who can deal with it. So, you know, again, just um, a phenomenal, a phenomenal thanks uh, for all that. Um, um, people are always welcome to come and visit the unit as well. So we have a lot of people coming down just for a few days before the exam. They want to come down and sit in MBT, see lots of x-rays. Uh, you're always, always welcome to do that. Great. And um, it was uh, it was fantastic. And, and all patients, uh, you know, are consented to uh, to be shown on there uh, for teaching and educational purposes, uh, as, uh, as we all are. You know, Lee, it was amazing. Right. I'm going to end this poll now. OK. And then I'm going to share it. OK, Lee, do you want to just whiz through this? Uh, yeah. OK, so most, most common uh, primary bone tumour in the UK in children, so as a child. So that rules out chondrosarcoma because that's in adults. Vast majority of people have got it right. Osteosarcoma, uh, Ewing's is the second most common in children. Giant cell tumours are in between 20 and 40, so that can't be right. And chordomas are in the elderly as well. The vast majority of people got it right. Osteosarcoma, well done. Which tumour does not have an association with a pre-existing condition? Excellent, well done. So chondrosarcomas, we talked about oleos, Ewing's and chondromas, HME. Uh, Ewing sarcoma, we said is a translocation. So it's when one cell divides, part of genetic information goes, so it can't have a predisposition. Uh, uh, predisposition. Osteosarcoma does. Cord chordoma does have one called uh, benign nodes called remnants. It's a spine tumor, particularly in the sacrum and spine. And fibrosarcoma, um, a fibrous dysplasia can rarely turn into fibrosarcoma. So that's the predisposing condition, fibrous dysplasia for a fibrosarcoma. Uh, what's the most common site? Distal femur, 96%. Oh, look at that. My Sunday even has not been wasted. Well done, guys. So, of course, if you see something in the distal femur, in a in a young guy, a young patient, we're thinking about a, an osteosarcoma. Okay, so this one's a really really difficult question. Which does not metastasize? Chordoma does. It's a, a malignant tumor of uh, of the spine. It's said to be slow growing, but about thirty percent metastasize. Osteosarcoma clearly metastasized, about ten percent of presentation. Chondroblastoma is a, uh, a rare tumour which is benign and unfortunately very rarely, like giant cell tumours, both of these can have metastases even though they're technically benign. So um, uh, the one that I would have expected some people to have known about was giant cell tumours, but eosilophenic granuloma is a completely benign disease, never has any metastases. Most common staging is high grade and outside the bone. That's correct, 2B. Um, which of the following tumours are treated by chemotherapy and radiotherapy? So we said that Ewing sarcoma, chondrosarcoma is not chemo or radiosensitive. Ewing sarcoma can be treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Osteosarcoma is not radiosensitive. It's only chemosensitive. Chordoma is uh, uh, radiosensitive, but not chemosensitive. And soft tissue sarcoma, as we said, are normally treated with radiotherapy before or afterwards. Typically, which tumour causes uh, joint uh, bone destruction uh, next to the joint in 20 to 40 year olds? Amazing. Again, giant cell tumours, so next to the bone, right age group 20 to 40, not a child. Most common soft tissue sarcoma, we said, was liposarcoma, as well done. Uh, okay, which is not 94% uh, said that uh, an open biopsy was not appropriate. I didn't mention PET scans, but it's not inappropriate to get a PET scan. It certainly is inappropriate to do an open biopsy without talking to us. So if you've got a multiple metastatic patient, we might say, okay, nail it, and it's got tumour everywhere in all the different bones and take a sample at the time, but you must discuss it with us before you do. And finally, which tumour is typically found in the epiphysis of long bones? 
Ewing's is in the diaphysis. Osteosarcoma is in the metaphysis. Chondroblastoma is the, one of the only tumors that's found in the epiphysis. Chondrosarcomas are generally around the hip. Eosinophilic granulomas are generally in the mid shaft of the bone by that first case of jaw. It's really, really pleasing for me uh, to see that the majority of uh, people got everyone wrong, right, apart from the horrible question, which was the uh, gold medal question. Great. So um, that was great. I mean, it was really good to see that the majority of people um, have got uh, most of the answers right. Uh, really good pal of mine when we were trainees together, you know, he used to, uh, the night before the exam, you'll be, you'll be uh, in a hotel somewhere and, uh, and one of your pals will say to you, uh, oh, you know, you know about such a thing, don't you? And you won't. You'll have never even heard about it. Or you might have heard about it five years earlier. And you'll go into a panic because you'll think, oh, you know, what happens if they ask me that tomorrow? This is going to be a disaster. And he was such an uplifting, positive person. He would always say, look, just relax because you know it now. And this is what the whole exam's about. It's about trying to get as much information as you can, but you will not know everything. So even if at the 11th hour, somebody gives you a, a knowledge bomb, that's great because you now know it, okay? So you just try and get that across, that you're not going to know everything. You're just trying to get as much as you can, and you'll still be learning right up until the minute you walk into the exam, all right? So, uh, so don't panic if anything there tonight was, uh, was new to you. So hopefully you now know it, or at least you can go back and you can uh, resource it and find out these, uh, these uh, gaps in your knowledge. And we as examiners know that there are holes in all your knowledge and, uh, and it's for you to try and um, you know, fill in as much of that knowledge gap. But, um, and, and I think one of the important things is as well, is, is it's an exam for safety, as Mike said all along, and that actually knowing whether it's an adamantinomia or an osteosarcoma isn't the important thing. The important thing is knowing that it's not right and it needs to go to the right place to be investigated. And the most important things are gonna be about the principles of biopsy, the principles of treatment, and knowing what we talked about before, whether it's something to worry about. That was great. So we'll hand over to Kat and George, if you've got any, uh, any comments at the end of the, the talk or anything like that. Just Thank like you. to reflect some of the comments that have come to say how an excellent talk that was. Um, and somebody said, can we please have the kind of non-malignant side of the talk as well? Uh, which I think would be really helpful um, if we can arrange it. Yeah, I'm more than happy, as uh, providing you, you've got a hectic schedule, but uh, at some point I'm more than happy to do it. And maybe yeah. touch on metastasis, which is important as well, because you're probably more likely to get metastasis in the exam. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Great. So your timing, as usual, uh, Lee, apart from when we're meeting up for a drink, is <laughs> impeccable. And, um, you know, that was, I just can't tell you how much I enjoyed that. It was absolutely amazing. And we're just getting phenomenal emails to us saying how, how great it was. Lot, you know, the comments are incredible. So we don't want to keep you too long. We know uh, you're all busy people. You want to go and have a bit of a relaxation. Lee, you'll be exhausted now. So just go and relax, try and take things a bit easy. Uh, but that was outstanding. So, I'm gonna, and you know, lots of participants have stayed right till the end again. That just shows just how outstanding that was. So um, keep us informed. If there's anything you want to know about, any talks, let us know. This is the only way we get better is by your feedback. So uh, thank you again uh, for tonight. It's been a really outstanding talk. So uh, keep well and keep safe, everyone. All right. Cheers. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, George. And most of all, thanks. Cheers.